This program is brought to you by Pussy Magnets. Put a hand on your friend with a Pussy Magnet. Welcome, welcome, my lovely lumps. Or should I say lovely labs? I'm so thrilled to have you here in the Labia Lounge to yarn about all things sexuality, womanhood, holistic health, and everything in between. Your legs. <laughs> Ah, can never help myself. Anyway, we're going to have vag loads of real chats with real people about real shit. So buckle up, you're about to receive the sex ed that you never had and have a bloody good laugh while you're at it. Before we get stuck in, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this, the Manang people. It's an absolute privilege to be living and creating dope podcast content on Noongar country, and I pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, if you're all ready, let's flap and do this. <laughs> oh God, is there such thing as too many vagina jokes in the one intro? <laughs> Whatever, I'm leaving it in. It's my podcast. Don't panic, you're not broken. Your sex education was a piece of shit. Get your flaps out and pull the couch. It's the Labia Lounge. Hey, my labial legends. Welcome back to the lounge. Today I've got myself a very impressive and inspiring guest to chat about mental health and a really cool global solution that's currently in the works with which she plans to change the entire face of mental health and in fact all health across the planet. Um, So that sounds like a pretty massive mission, I know, but let me introduce my guest and give you a taste of what she's capable of and then we'll chat because yeah, this, this woman is just like so phenomenal and I'm constantly inspired and surprised by what she's up to. So Nicole Gibson is a modern day philosopher redefining what it means to be an entrepreneur. Obsessed by love's power to affect change, Nicole's focus is to facilitate a tipping point in human consciousness to successfully actualize a civilization of love by 2030. Combining the intersections of visionary technology, transformative arts, and complex systems thinking, Nicole is building a bridge to an entirely new way of living and being for humanity. While leading events and facilitating experiences for over one million people, Nicole identified a code that unlocked humanity's greatest potential. Spanning from the establishment of a charitable organisation to becoming the youngest Commonwealth Commissioner in history to launching a social movement with a reach across 40 countries, Nicole's main preoccupation is to leverage love's power to transform and scale it to 350 million people globally. Listed as Australia's top 100 most influential women, finalist for Young Australian of the Year and Pride of Australia medalist, Nicole is just getting started. And like, that is just got to, that's got to be the most intense bio I've ever read out. There is so much in there. You're a fucking powerhouse. Welcome, Nick. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. Oh my God. I just cannot keep up with you and what you're yeah how old are you at the moment 30 years old dude I can't even yeah you are a unique human being I can't even imagine what you are going to have achieved by the time you're actually 70 um give us a bit of a rundown on your journey and how you kind of wound up being like when I met you you were actually the youngest commonwealth commissioner that's right. um, and obviously very passionate about mental health because um, of your own journey. You fr- Feel free to share as much or as little of um, your journey with that as you like. But maybe just give us a bit of bit of the backstory of, of Nicole. For sure, yeah. I mean, let's, let's go there and feel free to guide the conversation um, in, into the, the areas and, and the corridors that would be most interesting to, to your audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I think – what comes to mind in, in this question first first and foremost is um, what really creates drive in someone? Because I think um, definitely drive can be somewhat innate, but I think, you know, nurture and life experience also has a lot to do with it. And I know for me it was definitely those experiences through childhood and adolescence that created I guess just this in, insatiable obsession to want to drive change in the world to the, to the mm-hmm. point that um, it's just not something I could ignore anymore. And I guess mm. some people re- reflect that and have reflected that over the years as 
something I'm very lucky to have found, which is definitely true. I think having a life that mm. is purpose driven, mission driven is, um, is a massive blessing. And, you know, there's, yeah. there's another side to that, which is I can't not do it. And so imagine being in a relationship mm. with something that, that you feel, um, you know, no matter what is kind of pro- pushing you and propelling you. And I guess the, the, the dark side of that, and I know on this show we talk about kind of, you know, the, 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 the real shit and the taboos is uh, the, the other side of that is it can be um, something that I've got to manage, you know, like mm. being ambitious to the point that you at times ignore reality, for instance. Um, is I think a pain point that many visionaries experience that isn't really discussed. So all that Mm. being said, maybe that's content we can jump into. Um, Mm. I went through an eating disorder through my teenage years, um, essentially driven by I think substantial amounts of change and transition through childhood. So I went to many different schools, about eight different schools um, between Australia and, and the UK. Um, almost a school year for the first, uh, well, wow. actually a school year for the first uh, fair few years of, of schooling mm. um, and then left mainstream school at 14 to pursue performance and a couple of other, I think, you know, traumas and, and things that happened to me. Basically, it was a, a cocktail of, um, uh, it was kind of the perfect cocktail to, to drive eating disordered behaviours, which which really anchored yeah. in. Yeah, just a need to feel in control, I think. Um, mm-hmm. my, my need to feel like I could control something in my life. And I think also exacerbated by the fact that I was at 14 going to an excellence academy for performance and had a, a undeniable pressure from the industry and then the pressure I put on myself to, to fit a certain kind of um, idea of perfection. Um, and then my natural kind of tendency is towards, you know, wanting to achieve that, that perfection. Um, and so all that being said, I guess in the experience, for someone that's gone through an eating disorder, they would understand and for someone that, that hasn't, I'll do my best to try and explain. It's really like, it's like being in a prison inside your own mind in the sense that you know, the complex thing about an eating disorder, unlike most other disorders or illnesses, is you don't want to get better. And I think that's the yeah. biggest differentiating factor. Like if, if you have cancer, you want to get better, I would say. Mm. And I think that's a fair assumption. If you, if you have yeah. another another illness, there's, there's something in you that, you know, doesn't want to be in that state of suffering. But for someone that's got, going through anorexia, you know, you want to do anything to protect the illness. And so you're in a psychological frame of mind where your mind really is going against everything that should be innate, you know, our innate desire impulse to want to nourish ourselves, feed ourselves, um, look after ourselves. It's just not there. And, in fact, it's the opposite. Your tendency is is self-punishment. Um. Yeah, so it's, it's complex, you know, and I think that uh, being met with how the health system sees, I think it's improved somewhat since then, but going back 15 years ago, eating disorders, anorexia in particular, like the actual diagnosis means loss of appetite. So it's seen as a physical condition for starters, but it's just a physical loss of appetite, which is really oh, what? not true you know, <laughs> at all. Um and, and so it's treated as such, you know, a, a lot of the time the, the mm-hmm. deeper layers, the psychological layers around self-love um, are just not part of therapy. And so mm. it can, they, can, they can also create a lot of trauma, you know, because you, 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 yeah. you're you taking away the, 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 met- the metric of control that is keeping that person in a sense of feeling safe. You're not replacing it with anything, and then you're confronting that person with something that's deeply traumatic, you know, multiple times a day, <clears throat> and expecting them to heal. And yeah. on the other side of that, socially, because it's a very physical condition, I really got to see, you know, very visibly people's reaction to mental illness, you know, and and I think beyond mental illness, um, 
what people perceived as vulnerability and fragility because it was visible. Mm. And yeah. in that experience, it was just so clear that we're so uncomfortable with being in the presence of anything that's really vulnerable. Um, and then what happens as a, as a result of that, for the most part, is we unconsciously reject um, what's in front of us because we, we don't know how to feel comfortable with that. And then that, you know, in turn dehumanizes someone, um, making it so difficult to heal. And so I became very passionate about addressing that because where my mind went to was, well, I'm just, you know, one one person that's dealing with meaning sort of what other major points of pain and vulnerability are we not addressing as a world? Um, And what problems aren't we solving as a result of not being willing to get uncomfortable? Um, And that was, I guess, that the the instigation of this drive in me to want to, to want to find out, um, to want to do my best to, to ease that suffering in some way in the world. Yeah. 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 Makes so much sense. I mean, that's why I got into the work I'm doing now as well. You know, that just used to be such a huge uh, area of suffering and pain and challenge. And, and yeah, just want to be able to help as many people as possible in that department. So it's kind of a similar thing. And I really resonate with, yeah, feeling like, because most of the time I'm like, the only way I want to live is by being so purpose-led and having such a strong vision and passion and being so inspired by what I'm doing. And that's why I get out of bed. That's why I slog it out with this business. And then a small percentage of the time I'm like, fuck though, wouldn't ignorance just be bliss? I wish I didn't have such yeah. a strong drive to like, you know, make a yeah. difference. Change the world these. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. It's just exhausting. And it is like a bit of a, it's, it's so rewarding and nourishing. And obviously we wouldn't have it any other way, but it's definitely, you know, a huge responsibility and can feel like a bit of a burden. Mm. And like I've been wondering, um, you know, looking at your accolades and just thinking like, whoa, like how the fuck do you have time for dating or for your own (laughs) self-care? And like how does that show up in relationship? Like do you find that because you've got such huge ambition and your vision is so important, it's like your top priority, like does that make it difficult to find someone that you're compatible with or to like have space for? a relationship yeah I mean it's a really interesting question and I feel like you know I'm now at 30 in a different place with all of this but to reflect on my relationships in my early mid and even you know late 20s in in some ways but I think definitely early to mid 20s I think the most painful part of it was when you become very developed in the area of career and you start getting the social kind of proof that what you're doing is is working um at a very young age you know I was very I was 18 when I when I started this journey and I start I, I got quite a lot of success quickly doesn't mean that I was emotionally developed and so you have the world you know saying yes your success putting you on a pedestal and then in in my relationships um, I think what used to happen a lot was my partners would also see um, that professional status and have an expectation of how I would be in an right. intimate context. And mm-hmm. I had a lot of trauma still that I hadn't resolved. And mm-hmm. I, I don't feel like I had a lot of forgiveness for, of that, you know, because I was constantly being held to this idea of who I was on on yeah. stage, which, mm. you know, and I think what human beings really struggle with a lot of the time and what I'm passionate about helping people remember is just because someone, you know, is uh, contradicts themselves in some ways doesn't make it less genuine. Like I can hand on heart say that every time I've stood on stage or facilitated someone, my heart has been a hundred percent there. I've never felt like I've faked it till I've made it. You know, every, every word I've said in my professional career has been anchored in a deep sense of like, this is truly what I believe. And that, that can be true and you can still be working on yourself simultaneously. Mm. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and I think that we, we sometimes lose um, empathy and we lose compassion and we, mm. we lose, um, yeah, the ability to humanise someone when there's a clout to what they've accomplished. Yeah. You know, totally. and we start to sort of want to pick it apart as if it's not real. And definitely in my first few relationships, uh, and I don't say this to kind of disown my responsibility in, in why the relationships didn't work because I'm, I'm a deeply flawed human being, you know, <laughs> and, and, and constantly evolving and growing. And then I hope that after, you know, 15 years of, of, of dating, I feel like I'm finally understanding what it means to, to build a secure foundation and so to be radically honest and transparent and put everything on the table and work through challenges and be emotionally stable and have my own back and meet my own needs and all those things that all of us ultimately want to get to, I feel like, you know, I really am arriving in this beautiful place. But managing all of the success and having a huge amount of, I guess, adoration in a lot of ways publicly um, Mm -hmm. definitely made it difficult to face where I actually was in an intimate setting in an, in, in, in an intimate context. And I was also traveling constantly. So, you know, the contrast mm. of touring, speaking on stages, doing book signings, like having so, so much like of that admiration from the public and then going back to a partner that really hadn't experienced any of that with me. You know, yeah. I think especially in my, um, like from 22 maybe to to 25, I went through a phase where I actually really didn't know how to handle that and I relied heavily on um, escapism. Like my partner and I at the time partied heaps, you know, and, and I, I definitely was abusing um, sobriety. Uh, to, to, to just deal with not knowing how to land, you know, into any kind of normality. Um, and I, I didn't, you know, I wanted to feel connected to my partner at the time and I didn't know how to yeah. get her to understand what I was dealing with. And so that that's what we would default to. And that was a very yeah. kind of painful, that was a very painful thing. That was a, that was a hole I had to climb out of. Um, mm-hmm because it put me at odds ultimately with my integrity as a leader. Um, mm-hmm. But that was, is a deep journey. You know, it's, a, it's an existential yeah. journey to manage those two, those two worlds. And I think many leaders um, have struggled with this. I mean, people reference mm-hmm. Gandhi apparently was a terrible father, you know, and he was like the, the, wow. the, 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 the spiritual leader of, uh, of the, of the millennia and I think that these contradictions mm. are a common thing and you know interestingly yeah. I I just um just got my my second book in my hands yesterday I have it here with me um wow. it's it, it's called legacy disorder and it actually explores these these ideas where out the pursuit of legacy um and the the obsession with wanting to succeed how it often will create radical um, like delusions in our personal life because we become unwilling to mm. look at ourselves. And the journey of writing this book really was about becoming a congruent human being, showing up with my wow. mum and dad and my partner and my friends as I do, you know, the world mm. um, and, and knowing what that means. Massive. I got to get myself a copy of that book. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like um, the more clout you have and the more well-known or, um, you know, pedestalized you become, the less forgiving people are. Mm. If you're, you know, like hearing Gandhi was a bad father, it's like, are you kidding me? Like, well, how dare he? <laughs> and I don't feel this way, but I'm sure yeah. like a lot of people would be very, very um, feel quite betrayed by that and be like, what a fraud, what a phony. Um, right. But it's like, you know, people who have got such a massive, um, you know, they've got the world on their shoulders when they have that much 
uh, responsibility and they can affect that much change and they're doing such huge things. They've got such a large mission for like one person. Um, it makes sense to me that, you know, there might be less space left over to like develop as, you know, an emotionally intelligent, regulated, balanced human in other right. areas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if anything, there should be more compassion for that. Um, I agree. And I guess, yeah, it's it's just tricky when someone – glorifies you or has you on this pedestal and you are doing such amazing stuff I feel like it happens a lot you know we want to raise women up and we're all encouraging and excited when they're on the incline and then they reach a certain level of fame or popularity and all of a sudden we're picking them apart we're tearing them down Um, and if there's a single you know discrepancy between like the way that we see them on this you know beautiful golden pedestal we're just like super unforgiving about that and it's just like how dare they and it's like well we're all flawed humans like yeah it's it must be very tricky to like bear the weight of like just being so well known and having people yeah look up to you or idolize you for whatever reason like that's so much pressure I can imagine yeah, I mean, it's a it's a point that I've become, I think, through the writing process because I've explored it so deeply, you know, what is the um, sort of obsessive need we have as a society to, um, to, to, to judge once someone meets, I think, any kind of criteria that society has deemed as the most important thing. So if you're successful in a financial, you know, capacity or if you've made a huge impact in the world so you have influence or you're beautiful I think that's another that's another kind of Mm. privilege that's shrouded in in a lot of bias um if you have these things because society has put so much weight on that there's this unconscious perception that you know that is everything if you if you have that then there must be no Mm. problems in your life and I'm not going to give you any space or compassion because you have that success or you have that beauty. Therefore, everything must be fine mm. because there's an unconscious belief for a lot of us that once we have those things, all of our problems will magically go away. And what mm. I really, what I really encourage people to understand is these things magnify the problems you currently have. You know, there's a, mm. there's a saying that I really love, which is everyone wants a million dollars, but not everyone wants a million dollar problems. Um, and you know, the insecure, <laughs> the insecurities you have now, if you were to add fame, if you were to add social status, power, influence, if you were to add huge amounts of affluence and wealth, whatever those securities are now just become magnified. It makes you more yeah. of what you already are. And that's why it's so important to address these things, you know, as, as you rise, if you really do want to go on a journey of of success, if you want to go on a journey of um, becoming an influential person in the world, addressing these things so that you're no longer, again, it's a paradox, identified with that success is so important. Knowing who you are separate to that success. And mm. I think that that's really the only way that you can do it sustainably, that you can do it in a way that um, – that really is anchored in integrity because as soon as there's a as soon as you're trying to get a sense of worth or a sense of you know power from anything external um you instantly become corruptible you instantly become someone that will have some kind of you know weak point um, that can yeah. be manipulated because there's a need that you have that, that you're not fulfilling within you. Mm. And, and I think therein mm. lies like the biggest, um, issue that we have as a Western mm. society is we haven't learned to not externalize these things. We haven't, we haven't valued our interiority more than what we see. Um, on the outside and I I think you know my next few years of advocacy as a thought leader is really about this it's it's helping people and leaders Mm -hmm. understand you've got to be right with you and anything you build you know on a foundation that's not that is in some way perpetuating the same issues in the world Mm -hmm. yeah massive yeah totally something that I was just thinking 
about is we're so, especially like in, in the West, we're so often like devoid of culture and tradition and this sort of rich foundation and we're so desperate for role models. Mm-hmm. Combine that with really, really like strong inner critics and perfectionism mm-hmm. and all of a sudden we have like no room to forgive our role models that we've all of a sudden adopted and idolized and put right. expectations and projections on you know, if they don't meet our criteria or if they don't live up to our kind of expectation of what we believe they should be. And it's, it's just like, yeah, I, I, I like to be as transparent as possible and as authentic as possible about my flaws and my struggles and challenges. Cause like, I've got zero interest in people putting me on a pedestal and being like, oh, she's a sex expert. She must just be like so incredible and great at every single thing to do with sex and have no issues with, you know, intimacy or her relationships. And it's just like, yeah, I don't find that helpful to perpetuate that. And I just think perfectionism is like, oh, oh my God, just the devil. It's, it's a bad time. Um, <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Um, I think that there's an interesting point here too, which is where does that un, where does that lack of forgiveness come from you know in the in the mainstream populace and i think again one of the things i've been thinking about is the the two types of of power that kind of exist in the world the first being power and control which i think is what most of us are used to seeing from powerful figures in our world that the way they've mm-hmm. risen to power and maintain power is through mechanics of control fear oppression yeah. separation And I think what we need to move into is a paradigm of uh, power and love, that that, that there's a true Mm. powerfulness that comes from love. And because that's so rare, what I think has happened again unconsciously in that projection that the mainstream have on powerful figures is actually we we unconsciously judge who we would be in that position of power. Yeah. And we innately don't trust ourselves. So Mm. if, if you're relating to someone that has power, there's a part of you that's like, well, I wouldn't be an integrous person if I had that much power. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I don't trust this this leader. And I think, again, it's a real invitation for us to look at the parts of ourselves that we don't trust, the parts of ourselves that are not in our power. And, um, you know, why haven't we claimed our power? Because if, if all of us could mm-hmm. feel congruent and comfortable and safe and integrous inside our own power, then we would all be powerful. So the yeah. fact that many people feel powerless, I think, is kind of indicative of, um, yeah, just a, 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 I don't want to say broken, but a challenged relationship with ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit dysfunctional, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Mm. Mm. So your kind of main focus at the moment is to do with tech um, that you're using to do some really cool AI stuff. Um, They'll kind of help realize that vision of actualizing a civilization of love. Um, And I'm kind of always just like amazed at how ballsy and bold that like declaration is like it's enormous like what a big mission going to actualize a civilization of love by 2030 and like you know when I've when I've um I was preparing for this podcast and I told my partner about your mission and he was kind of like what does that like what does that even mean how do you measure that what does that look like you know um and I think it's like so like so big that people struggle to actually wrap their head around what that would even mean and how you would make that happen. Um, so I'd love you to just talk us through a bit about, yeah, this this thing that you've got going on right now because um, totally. it's pretty exciting. Hey, babe town. So sorry to interrupt, but I simply had to pop my head into the lounge here and mention another virtual lounge that you've got to get around. It's the Labia Lounge Facebook group that I've created for listeners of the potty to mingle in. And there you'll find extra bits and bobs like freebies or discounts for offerings from guests who've been interviewed on the podcast, inspiring and thought-provoking conversations, and support from a community of labial legends. So head over to the links in the show notes and I'll hopefully see you in there. And now, back to the episode. Thank you. Yeah, it's my highest, my highest joy. So, I mean, let's, let's bring some definition to it. A civilization, um, in general, but specifically in how we define it as a team, um, is a, a series of systems. So when you think about the civilization that we live in right now, it's made up of systems of 
economics, systems of education, systems of um, technology, systems of health, um, so on and so forth. And all of those systems come together to create a, a society um, or a civilization. And so when we say civilization, we, we essentially mean a series of systems, a, a set of new systems that, that should, well, should not should, but that can be built um, in uh, an economy of love. And so that firstly focuses on what are the philosophical foundations of these systems uh, to, you know, how, how are these systems actually designed? So what are the what what are the values and what's the philosophy and then what is the actual mechanics? Um, there's a lot within our existing society and our existing systems that um, take education as an example that pin one against the other. So the actual design, you know, like the 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 way that um, a high school student will be marked is on a for the most part a bell curve. So it's it's a comparative system and that's how the system's designed, which is. That's what, what a lot of people don't understand is that's a function of design. We can redesign it. When you look at our system of economy, you know, the fact that it's a capped market. So the fact that entrepreneurs are fighting for market share, uh, that's because it's a capped market. So there's only a certain amount of money in the world, which is also what causes inflation. Again, that's a, that's a systems design flaw. If, if you think about it in the context of um, what's actually possible, which is systems that are truly infinite, truly abundant, um, and that comes down to values like uh, love, trust, generosity. <laughs> you know, when, when you have uh, systems that are built on these kinds of principles and not competitiveness, which is what our existing systems are, are ultimately built on, health is similar, like those that get better treatment are the ones that can afford better treatment. Mm -hmm. That's especially true here in the in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you know what what a lot of people say is that the, that our systems are broken, and I, I argue that point. It's systems are perfectly designed to do what systems do. You know, <laughs> uh, the, the 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 system is perfectly designed to create the outcomes it's creating. So mm -hmm. it's really less about thinking how do we fix the current system and more about in my opinion, thinking how do we design systems from a completely different foundation. Um, mm. And I think that really matters because we will, as we've seen many other civilizations before the West, fall in, in our uh, you know, history books, um, the West will, will too reach that, that point. And I think with the rise of artificial intelligence, it's, it's inevitable that some of the very key pillars that hold our economy in place right now, like value is human effort in, in today's economy. That's, that's what drives value. Gold, when it's sitting in a mine, doesn't actually have value. Gold only has value once it's been extracted uh, by, by man and, and processed and then put on the market. So it's that human effort that creates value. Now, a lot of that um, idea around value which simply put is time. You know, most people in the world are trading time for money. That's no longer mm. going to be relevant because of artificial intelligence. So a lot of the, the manual labor that has been uh, basically how people have created a livelihood um, will become obsolete. So that poses far more of an existential question to me than it does a practical one. Because the question that really comes up is, what is meaning? How do I, how do I create meaning in my life if it's no longer defined by what I do? If once upon a time, you know, this is probably the last book, unless I really just wanted to do it for the love, I'm ever going to write that is, is me sitting down on a laptop writing every single word. Because the, the system's now available to be able to write a book. You know, I could, yeah. what, what took me six months, realistically, I could do in a week. Um, well, I can, I yeah. can train an AI model on everything I've ever written. I can prompt it, you know, around the subject matter that I want to write on. I can, I can wow. train it to understand the framework. It's going to write exactly like me. It's going to be, it's going to convey all of my ideas through the prompts and the guidance I've given the artificial intelligence and it will be done. So there's a part of me that identified with, with this, 
identity of an author, right? And the the reason I identified with it, the thing that I found kind of self worth and value in was my tenacity and discipline to be able to sit down and write a book. Yeah. Because because not everyone can do that. Or not not everyone Mm -hmm. um has been able to do that. But you know, that that playing field um is about to be leveled out. Every single person can write a book, you know. So they're very philosophical, fundamental shifts that we're going through societally right now, whether you're aware of it or not, that will compound majorly in the next one, three, yeah. five, ten years. Um, and I want Love Out Loud to really be at the forefront of of that transition because our systems will fall. They're already falling. And so what are going to be the new systems that that rise? And, I mean, there's a lot of work to be done. Um our kind of key focus at the moment is in in launching our accelerator. So we've we reimagined and then uh, transformed the work we've done with our Master Heart alumni into um, a full six month accelerator program, and that was after really reviewing, analyzing, chatting to to to, to people that did the program and really understanding, you know, the the support entrepreneurs need in our world right now is actually so much more in depth than um what our previous systems could really extract it's it's really about holding the entrepreneur's hand through all of these modules to get them market ready so that they can really be at the, the forefront of that um of that movement you know of, of the future of business and i always believe deeply in entrepreneurship as the architects of our world you know, an entrepreneur is an artist in the 3D. Their, their mm. art is creating the world, you know, the, the, the creating the systems. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, that that's huge, that, that's really important, that really matters, creating an ecosystem that can empower the founders that are building the solutions of the future. Mm. So it's not just us, we're doing it together, it's a series of leaders that are prepared to take on um, these major problems and find meaningful solutions. Um, yeah. And then, and then the technology, it's like our state of being is the, the, the most crucial ingredient. So we need tools. And I believe technology is one of the best tools to be able to support us to master our state, master our emotional body so that we can remain level and centered and, um, and, and be masterful in how we're showing up in the world. And so that's, that's really the positioning of, in truth tech it's a tech that's measuring your emotional state in real time and, and giving you feedback on your emotional patterns so that rather than sitting in therapy for the next 50 years you know two weeks of tracking can give you massively deep and important insights in, into you so that you can work through them you know much much faster mm, yeah yeah i fall into the uh habit pretty frequently of getting really terrified about what technology is doing and how it's impacting mental health negatively. And then I just have to remember that, you know, there's also the other side of it, which is people like you and all of the entrepreneurs that are going to go through your accelerator program and just, yeah, all of these incredible like visionaries that will be using technology, you know, to try to to try to actually improve mental health and to counteract the damage that is being done um, by like just how quickly, yeah, the landscape is shifting and and people's existential dread that comes from that. Um, so I, I tend to be a bit of a, uh, I've always been a little bit like resistant to technology. I think like the time that I was born and just, I don't know, I'm just slightly too old to have gotten on the <laughs> on the wave and so like I didn't have like social media until I was in my 20s and stuff like that so I've been very resistant and a bit of a Luddite and I kind of have had to try to you know learn to do more than just check my emails because I run a business now and I've started a podcast and you know created online courses and I've been like you know YouTube tutorialing my way along um but I'm still just like so set in my ways in in a lot of regards and it really scares me that I'm just going to be totally left behind and obsolete and I won't be able to keep up with, you know, tech. And then <laughs> to add to that, all of the kind of um, pressures and the way that 
you know, even just social media alone, like influences mental health um, and how I'm noticing that manifesting in everyone in my life, it's mm-hmm. horrifying. And so it, it makes sense that technology would also hold the key to to counteracting that. So, That's like, that. tell me mm-hmm. more about this app that you're creating um, to kind of use as a tool to get this this civilization of love happening and and how you're going how that works how you're going to actually measure whether it's you know shifting the needle mm-hmm. like some of the ins and outs of the the really like practical tangible elements of this yeah let's let's get technical so um i'm hearing you want me to kind of explain how we've developed the technology i think um a really important thing to understand which i've i've developed through becoming a tech founder, you know, a lot more of an appreciation of than when I was simply a tech consumer is I had this kind of idea that tech was an iPhone, you know, that, that tech was a, a laptop. Um, Mm -hmm. and what I've come to understand is technology is, again, it's a system of thinking, you know, like when you think about the way a visual artist sees the world, there's a, you know, a watercolorist is thinking, in that frame they're thinking how do i how do i recreate this image that i see in my mind or that i want to paint what what is what is, how do i want to put these colors together how do i want the the paint to bleed you know there's a whole kind of process that that visual artist will go through to create a painting and to me technology is far more about how you manufacture how you engineer it's probably a better um, way of describing it, how you engineer a, um, uh, a solution um, in a way that creates something infinitely scalable, you know, because the wheel is as much of a technology as the iPhone. Um, yeah, true. It completely revolutionized the world at scale. <laughs> it really did. I think like before we had the wheel, we, only, we, could, yeah. we could only walk. So that was a massive... Um, that was a massive innovation. It was a technology. Um, so it was thinking, it was solving this problem first and foremost. And, and the problem was how do we move quicker? It wasn't the, the person that created a wheel wasn't thinking, how do I create a wheel? The person that created a real wheel was thinking, how do I move faster in the world? And I think that that's very mm. important to understand that, that tech visionaries, you know, I can almost guarantee you Steve Jobs wasn't thinking, how do I create an iPhone? He was thinking, how do I revolutionize communication? How do I make communication even more available? How do I make information even more available? Far before the, the specs and the designs of the iPhone came to be, the how mm-hmm. was secondary. And so I think that's important to understand because when I entered the field of tech, I wasn't thinking, how do I become a tech founder? I was focused on how do I transform the emotional awareness of a world in an infinitely scalable way. Mm. And I was obsessed yeah, with wow. that. I was obsessed with that question. Mm. And the question led me to understand that the process of how technology is developed and engineered is the most effective way of solving that problem at scale. But I went down many, 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 many rabbit holes, you know, many systems of creation mm. before I landed there. Um, and then even once I had landed there, there was still so many unknowns, you know, like what is emotion? Is an emotion like subjective? How do you, how do you get an objective measurement of emotion? Um, you know, what technology, you know, what, because technology, you know, l- leans on data. Like what, what data do we need to be collecting in order to get an insight? You know, all of these things were unknown. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know. So it was a huge process. I took a year. Um, just doing research and development, exploring different biotechnologies, what signals are giving us insight, why hasn't this been done? You know, emotion is such a, it's such an untapped, you know, part of human potential. Why is no one doing this? One of the points of feedback that I got consistently was emotion subjective, you cannot objectively measure it. What's so fascinating is that's not actually true. And that's probably been one of the biggest breakthroughs in my understanding that emotion is the almost immediate. So within 0.2 of a millisecond, um, 
sorry, 0.2 of a second, so 200 milliseconds, you have an emotional reaction to whatever stimulus you're being exposed to. So it's an involuntary reaction that you have no control over. You have no conscious control over that emotional reaction. The subjective layer is after seconds, two or three seconds, once that emotional trigger has been subjectively processed, i.e. you've layered on a story, your brain's come up with some kind of reason, which is probably not true, you know, uh, a story as to why you had that emotional reaction, which becomes a Mm -hmm. feeling. And that feeling is subjective because the feeling is the conscious or or subconscious uh, meaning making of that emotional Mm -hmm. state. And if you stay in that feeling, it becomes a mood after an hour or so. And if you stay in that mood, it becomes a state of being. But the emotion itself is very objective, objective enough to measure. But again, it was a series of like very intense trial and error and I had uh, I explored pretty much every biosig- uh, biosensor that existed on the market because I was like wow. you know I, I believe it, it's more genuine and true to the source for this data to be pulled from your physiology your bottle your body than to try to come up with a model of prediction that didn't seem right which a lot of companies have tried mm-hmm. to to crack this in that way so like let's analyze your you know your user behavior on your phone and try to predict how you're feeling this is this is how facebook markets to you right it uses yeah. sophisticated algorithms based on the content you're watching you know the words you're using to to determine and predict what you might be feeling i didn't mm-hmm. i didn't like that direction i wanted i wanted it based on your physiology your data that's actually your body and to, to try to create a mirror of what, what's actually going on for you in real time. Um, I really wanted heart rate variability to work because heart rate variability is uh, measured through a sensor called PPG. And PPG is available in most consumer wearables. So Fitbit, I'm wearing mm-hmm. two now, and now watch a BioStrap <laughs> doing some <laughs> testing on both devices. Uh, nice. and, 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 and an aura ring, um, the, the camera on your, on your smartphone is a HRV sensor. So HRV sensors are everywhere. And I was like, man, it would be so great if we could pull. How convenient. Kind of yeah. Yeah. And, and I had like a consensus no from all the scientists and development people. They were like, you can't, heart rate variability has two, um, th- there's too many variables. to to heart rate variability, you're never going to be able to get an accurate clinical reading. And so I shelved it for a whole year and I explored electrodermic sensors. Um, I explored eye tracking. I explored um, micro um, expressions through the camera. I explored so many different ways. A kinesiology tool using the gyroscope on the phone. Um, So a motion sensor to determine the level of flow in your body based on your movement. So I went, I went down many, many, many rabbit holes, right? <laughs> so fascinating. <laughs> and then, oh. yeah, then after a year, I was like, it just came to me. I was like, how is emotion measured clinically now? You know, what, what, what is the kind of gold standard? And it's, it uses EEG, so it uses headsets, basically, like clinical-grade mm. headsets. And the headsets are uh, sensing your valence and your arousal. So your valence is your level of stress matched with your level of motivation. So your level of motivation will either be positively or negatively geared. So you're moving towards something psychologically or you're moving away from something. That That is a signal that's happening in the brain and the body that can be tracked and arousal is your level of stress. So yeah, you put these two things together. If you're positively geared towards something, Um, so you have high valence and then you're high stress, you're like excited. I'm really positive and I'm full of energy, right? Or if you have like a low valence and low arousal, you're negatively geared, uh, and you're low stress, you're like sad, depressed, um, and everything in between. And so I knew that heart rate variability was actually very good at measuring arousal because it's used as a fitness tracker. Right, so that that's how fitness is determined: is how quickly is your heart rate accelerating, and then coming back down. So your cardiovascular health—it's—it's it's, uh, your 
your heart's response to being stressed and then being able to recover. Stressed and then recover. And so I was like, it's halfway there. You know, it measures arousal well. How do we get the valence? How do we, how do we get the nuanced data through the, the HRV sensor of valence? Because if I can crack that, then we can detect mm. emotion through HRV. And then it just came to me because I was kind of getting closer to solving this problem. I was like, what if we do an experiment where we use a standardized emotional imagery deck, like the one they always use in research, it's called Oasis, expose a subject that's hooked up to an EEG, so we're getting the baseline of valence and arousal, and HRV at the same time, then do a, an analysis of how, um, how far apart those two data points are at being able to measure arousal and valence, and then use the EEG data plus machine learning to train the HRV how to get a more accurate reading of valence. Could that work? Oh and that, that was the billion-dollar idea that, wow. that, that, right. that created the breakthrough in, in really being able to create something that now is um, less than one deviation, one standard deviation out of clinical grade data through a PPG sensor. Just on your phone. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on a, but this is a bias strap. This is a now watch. So these are just standard commercial wearables. Um, oh through, my God. through the in truth model, we'll be able to, to give you almost a clinical grade reading of, of your emotional state. Excuse the interruption, my loves, but I'm shamelessly seeking reviews and five star ratings for the potty because, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, it's pretty fab. And the more people who get to hear it, the more people it can help. Reviews and ratings help me curry favor with the algorithmic gods and get suggested to other listeners to check out. Plus, they make me feel really good and appreciated as I continue to pour my heart and soul into creating this baby for you. And I promise I don't maz over them or anything. I mostly just tuck them away for a rainy day when I'm filled with self-doubt and existential dread about being self-employed, which is fairly frequently. <laughs> so you see, leaving a review really does make a difference and it's an easy little act of support that you can take in just a minute or two by either going to Spotify and leaving five stars for the show or writing a written review and leaving five stars over on Apple Podcasts. Choose your poison, or if you're a real overachiever, you could do both. Whoa now. If you are writing a review, though, just be sure to only use G-rated words, because despite the fact that this is a podcast about sexuality, words like sex can be censored and your review won't actually show up. Lame. Anyway, oh, oh, what was that? Oh, you're going to go do it right now while I wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great idea. May as well just quickly click that five-star button before we get on with it and, you know, like forget about it and get on with your day. Um, um, oh, I'm hearing them roll in. I'm hearing those five stars. <laughs> oh my God, I make myself cringe. Anyway, uh, thank you much, Lee. You're a total gem and I'll let you get back to the episode now. Whoa. And then so is the idea that by bringing more awareness and understanding of your own emotional state regularly, you'll become more able to influence it because you're just focusing on it more and you're kind of like tracking it? Or how does it actually shift our mental health and get us feeling mm. better and, you know, moving towards that frequency of living from a place of love? Great question. So the first thing I'll say is awareness is an incredibly powerful intervention that is consistently dismissed as an intervention and i'll give you an example of this if you've never tracked your heart rate variability just your standard hrv and you wear an apple watch or you wear some kind of hrv device this is just a challenge to your listeners go and check what your average ms is so your average hrv right now whatever the, the app it is if it's your aura app or your apple health it'll tell you what your hrv average is if it's 20, if it's 30, if it's 50, 70, 100. If you have a pretty low HRV, like if you have like a already have a HRV of 100, you probably don't want it to go, you know, too much higher. But say you have a relatively low heart rate variability, it's better to have a high one, like around between 80 and 110 for someone young and fit and healthy is good, like kind of elite level. So if you have less than that, I challenge you to just learn what your HRV is 
and hold it in your awareness and monitor yourself over a week. And I would almost put money on the fact that your HRV will increase just through wow. just through your awareness, right? Not doing any other physical intervention. So awareness is a very powerful intervention, which is always dismissed in medicine. And I want to prove and showcase that simply through awareness, so much can be transformed. So there's, there's one layer. Like, yes, the awareness, I believe, is going to create huge fundamental you know, shifts. And that's why we go to therapy mm-hmm. because we're sitting with someone wanting to have that, that aha moment of like, oh, that's mm-hmm. the thing I've been feeling. It's, it's, it's shame. It's anxiety. It's depression. It's when, I, when I do music, I feel joy, you know, and I, I should do that more. You know, it's those kind of breakthroughs that I think can be so, so life changing. The second layer of it is the tech is also categorizing it against the tasks that you're doing day to day. So simply by, say, integrating it with your Google Calendar, it's then giving you the emotional spectrum and the emotional grade of everything that you do. So again, that's incredibly Mm. granular insight into, wow, every time I meet with my boss, because it's not just, here's your day, like the AI can also say that every time you eat this for lunch, this is what happens. Every time you meet with your boss, you go through the same emotional pattern. Every time you, you know, sleep in past 9 a.m., this is what it's doing to your emotional state. So it's starting to look Mm. at the correlations and it will start to show you the complex emotional patterns that make up your life. And that's very difficult, even for an avid meditator, even for someone that's, you know, paying thousands of dollars to a therapist every month. It's very, very hard to get that level of insight. And this is where mm. artificial intelligence and technology and data can become incredibly powerful. After a month of tracking, it's going to be able to show you the Fibonacci sequence of you wow. and, and exactly what's influencing it. And I think, you know, historically, it's taken meditators decades to get to that level of understanding and insight and um, you know, to me that the outcome for our users is going to be the level of, um, consciousness that can then go into the decisions they make in their day. Um, and that, you know, there's a lot of other things that can be developed on top of that. So once we have <clears throat> enough data from, from you as a user, we can also start to correlate things like, um, when, when your emotional fluctuation, which is one of our algorithms is calculating your level of emotional flux. As an example, wow. when your emotional flux is in this percentile, your decision-making capability is at 20%. So then, you know, imagine you have that insight, but then it also knows what you're up to. So it can say, hey, Freya, your emotional flux is here. Your decision-making capacity is at about 18% today. We see you have that meeting with the CEO in two hours. Um, there's a high chance he's going to ask you to sign a contract. Just letting you know this isn't an ideal time for you to be making definitive decisions. So either regulate oh. or, you know, move the meeting. So it can start to prompt you to, to, to actually show up in your life in a way that is, is a lot more conscious and, 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 and aware. Mm. Oh my God, this sounds fucking epic. <laughs> I'm so curious to start using it. And also like something that I really nerd out on is tracking my menstrual cycle and the way that my hormonal shifts really influence my mood and my energy levels and, um, you know, my capacity for for navigating things. And I feel like that would be something I'd be paying attention to as well using using this app at the yeah. same time. Um Whoa. Um, I've just noticed the time and I realized I haven't even done either of the segments. I just got so carried away. Um, do you have time to share with us a story um, about how your sex education, you know, either failed you or something you would have wanted to learn more about or a funny anecdote from, you know, when you were kind of going through puberty and learning about all of this sort of stuff. Um, Cause yeah, I'd love to do this segment, get pregnant and die. And then might even <laughs> slip in a little TMI as well. We'll just cram both the segments in. <laughs> Don't have sex. Cause you will get pregnant and die. Don't have sex. Missionary position. Don't have, don't have sex standing up. Just don't do it. Promise. Wow. Okay. 
how how my sex education failed me. Um, Worry if yeah. it was amazing, we'd love to hear that, but that's very it rarely the case. So, yeah. It definitely was not. I mean, you know, half British education for starters. Is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it was just such a non-event. Like I kind of remember doing mm-hmm. – I don't know, some putting some condoms on, on a banana. I think most of your guests mm-hmm. probably would share similar <laughs> similar mem- similar memories. Um, I think by the time I was doing such a ed- sex education in grade six, maybe, maybe seven, um, probably seven, I was going to, at that time, I was going to an all-girls school. So I think, I mean, that in itself, it's just like, I feel like, then I remember when the girls in my school were like exposed to boys. It was just such a mm. like big deal. <laughs> you know, and I think it was just so like not normalized. And then I'm obviously like into girls, so you know, mm. I don't I don't feel like I was ever kind of supported to understand those feelings. I think it was like very kind of pigeonholed I mean I was like trying to date boys at the mm. time but looking back yeah. like I definitely had crushes on my friends and I just didn't know how to like I did I didn't know how to understand that um yeah I mean it was <laughs> yeah. it was it was hard I, I think by the time that maybe this is like the the the, the TMI story by 20 I think I was about 23 maybe 24 um was it was when Australia was doing the um the the plebiscite the the vote for, uh, for whether or not gay gay marriage should be legalized yeah. and I got into a fight with my then girlfriend at the time because she was like you should be using your platform to to talk about this right. and I was like I don't care you know I don't I don't care if we're allowed to get married. Like, it just doesn't matter to me. You know, fuck the government. <laughs> I don't want to be a part of this conversation. I don't. I don't want to be defined by my sexuality as well. Like, I had this whole thing where I was like, yeah. I don't want to be known for that. I want to be known for, you know, yeah. I don't want that to define me. Yeah, yeah. And then, so I was, I was very kind of like bullish about that position at that time. And I was on a trip in Mexico um, and we were swimming in these, uh, these, these caves, these cenotas, and this boy who was clearly gay, who sounded Australian, who was with his mates, who was also um, there in that, in that same swimming spot. And he was talking to his friends and then he, he checked his phone and he just started to break down and cry um, and he was just so emotional, I was overcome, and it was something in me just intuitively I knew that he had read that we won Aww. the vote. Mm. And in that moment, I just, it was like 23 or 24 years of shame I didn't know I had. Wow. Mm. Just completely, like, washed over me, and it was, I just felt so emotional at the fact that Mm. I had internalized my own homophobia so deeply that even though I had a position to influence and help other, you know, young people that maybe followed me, I was doing a lot of work in high schools at the time, to, to say to them, hey, like, I'm gay and I'm still successful and it doesn't have to define you and I love you and, and you're you're amazing just as you are. You know, I, I never used my platform for that and it was because I was homophobic. I hadn't accepted myself. But the way I rationalised it was I just don't care because I didn't want to be vulnerable. I didn't want to feel those feelings of, of shame and it wasn't until I saw that, that boy's emotion and I had my kind of human right return to me. Yeah. Was I like, oh, my God, Wow! I actually, I just never wanted to feel the shame that I actually did feel mm. through, through all of that. And to be in so much resistance of being known for that mm. mm-hmm. was, all, was all shame. 
you know, whereas now as I've kind of worked through that and I've matured, if I have an opportunity, like if I can be an emblem for someone like an, an, another girl that has a crush on her best friend in high school and yeah. is thinking, you know, this might be the, this might be the <laughs> reason I, you know, I'm not going to be popular or this might be the reason that, you know, my friends are going to reject me or whatever it is. I think, I think the world's changed a lot since then, but mm. you know, um, of course, of course I should use my experience, you know, the, the wholeness of who I am to, to, to be that representation in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, I learned a lot from that experience. I learned that sometimes, you know, we, we can be something and when societies had, you know, opinions about that, we internalize. And I think it also happens with, um, with women. Like I see it sometimes with women I'm associated with professionally. They are on the outside a stand for women's empowerment, but they've internalized the misogyny they've experienced and they actually end up treating women like shit. Yeah. Yep. You know, and, and I think it, it can play out in these really weird ways that are often not obvious. Yeah. Um, and I guess my message in that is actually it goes back to the beginning of this podcast. Like we've got to get right with ourselves. Do you mm. love and accept? Like I couldn't say I'm gay until I was like 27. Oh, wow. Even though like, even though I was like, I'd always had girlfriends. Yeah. I'd always, you know, yeah. mm. I'd lived my life like that. Like I'd never, I wasn't closeted in that way, but just, identifying with it was so hard yeah wow um yeah thank you so much for sharing i loved that story massive mm. yeah so yeah epic love love that we just smashed together both the segments nicely done <laughs> um before we wrap up i just want to like yeah kind of learn a little bit more about um, when this um, In Truth app is going to be available. Maybe it's already available. Like what's the latest? I know I think I just saw before we jumped on this call that you've got a really massive study going on. Like maybe if you have time to just talk us through that. But, yeah, pretty much just where it's at now, you know, when it's going to be ready, how people can use it and and sort of stay in touch with you and your work and, and um get involved when things are becoming available of course yeah thanks for the opportunity so we're opening our beta um so we're going to choose first 100 people mm -hmm. so um you know i think get, get get in quick if it's appealing to you mm -hmm. um and we're gonna we're gonna run it as a closed um coaching program it'll be free except for you have to buy the hardware of course mm -hmm. to enable it um, and we're doing that so that we can get really intimate feedback from the first hundred users of, you know, what they like about it, how they want to use it, what their feedback is. So we open that, um, well, it will begin mid November. Applications will open at, um, the beginning of November. So it'll be two weeks of enrollment. Uh, so that's, you know, soon. That's mm. just over a month away. Yeah. Um, then we'll take them through that one month process. Uh, and then as a team, we'll spend, probably four to eight sprints or sprints one week. Um, so, you know, one, one to two months basically uh, developing out all of the feedback, so changes to features, et cetera. <clears throat> and then um, it will be available for public uh, at the beginning of February next year. Wow. Okay, amazing. That's soon. How exciting. Yeah, yeah it's, it's all coming together. It's been a massive it's been the journey of a lifetime for sure. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's very, you know, I was, I was walking to gym this morning, just thinking like, I cannot believe, uh, there's going to be a technology that exists in the world that can, that can track emotional state. Like it's yeah. just such a, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a trip, mm. <laughs> you know, in, 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 in the best way, you know, in the, in the best possible way. So yeah, I would love your, your audience and, and you to, to be a part of that. If it's, if it's interesting, awesome. you can go to intruth, intruth.io. Just check the, um, check the website. I think there's, there's an option now to, to sign up, uh, for the beta. So you can just put yourself on a, on a wait list and, and we'll get in touch in a month or so. Rip Amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just to like paint us a little 
little picture of like this vision because I want to I want to just go back to yeah the fact that you've kind of figured out that critical mass is 350 million people and once you hit that amount of people that is the tipping point where like the love will just roll out to the rest of the planet like how do you think that that will look in the world? Like what will change? Obviously, that's a gigantic question and there's all the obvious things that we think of about how that will impact the world and everyone's health and mental health positively. But like are there things that, you know, maybe aren't so obvious that that you know through all of your research and your understanding are going to change in ways that people don't expect? This is such a good question and I got to say like this is something I fantasize about all the time <laughs> because like like any monumental shift like you you can't really predict like totally. you can imagine you can, yeah. you know you can fantasize yeah interestingly in 2020 I wrote a um a story which was me fantasizing mm. about that moment cool and um, the story essentially went, it was, a uh, um, an alien species, uh, on a, uh, a, a planet that was, um, co-inhabited by humanity at some point, um, teaching in, uh, a classroom, the story of how Earth woke up, uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to their students. And, um, I, you know, the teacher was kind of intimately explaining um, this monumental moment in the universe. Yeah. And the way they chose to depict it in the story was um, all of the earthlings kind of thought that it would be this very obvious, loud kind of, oh, my God, we made it. There's all this change and, you know, all of this truth that's violently revealed and, you know, kind of the, the dramatic uh, version of the story but actually – um, in the moment the critical mass point was met, it was a softening. Mm. Time slowed down. Wow. Humans uh, turned to each other and realized that they weren't, you know, enemies anymore. And, um, you know, they embraced and they um, they came back to, it makes me emotional even thinking about That's it, cool. to, um, yeah, to, to home. Yeah. And it was almost anticlimactic <laughs> you know it, it was a piece well oh, sounds but so nice you just don't, mm. you just don't know but i mean in in my fantasy it, it goes something like that yeah that's so beautiful that, that the, the, the war has been won you know totally. that, that all of the the drama actually ends and yeah we just we come back to what what's real and what's now Totally. I mean, that makes more sense to me that it's not this big, climactic, explosive, obvious thing. It's more like, well, all of a lot of the problems that I see, uh, you know, that we are too yang and busy and productive yeah. and capitalist, all of it. It's just like, actually, if we yeah. were more in touch with our hearts, then it would be a softening and a, and a becoming slower yeah. and more gentle and more in touch. And so it wouldn't be this big bang. It would totally be like a mellowing out and a slowing down um, because that's how we're designed to be. That is that is when we are at our most healthy and in touch with ourselves and our mental health is the best is like not when we're like racing around being, you know, super productive and crazy. It's It's, you know, it is the ability to like surrender and to slow down and to just take a beat. Um, and it's just really, it's really incredible that there are people like you who are able to hold that vision for those of us that, that don't, um, have it or aren't able to like really hang on to it, you know, in the face of all of the, the kind of existential dread and the fear mongering and the doom and gloom. And it's fucking scary out there. And like, I know me personally and so many friends, like the conversations we've been having are like grim and and we're scared and we're feeling that we're feeling the pressure we're feeling this like stuff is changing but we're unsure whether it's going to tip in this way or that way and it's fucking terrifying because there's a good chance it could dip that way but like you know when I talk to people like you or hear people like you speak and and hear what you're up to I'm just like oh wow okay no no it's fine we're good there is actually we'll okay. like you know there's there's it's That's just nice. this stuff that like I me and probably a lot of people just don't even dare to hope or to dream about um being possible 
but you you know you're a visionary right. and and you're making you're making massive moves and it's it's very yeah it's very heartening and reassuring <laughs> to people like me that are just like still kind of stuck on like a bit lower lower together. frequency <laughs> no i think it's it's you know we we're, we're, we're going to end up realizing that all of us played a role in the that moment you know mm. it's that there really there really is perfection to it all mm. there really is because the unified intelligence is always unified even if we're experiencing it separately and yeah. i think you know there's only one thing happening <laughs> you know <laughs> truly and, 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 and there's only one of us and it's that that's the cosmic joke however we choose to however we choose to look at it um mm. that is the truth and i think that, that that's that's important to remember you know <laughs> right on <laughs> absolutely <Yeah. laughs> oh thanks so much nick this has been just such an interesting chat I've loved and it. um yeah, just epic. Um, I'll put links to all of your info and to In Truth Tech, all of it in the show notes. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty excited to get on that get on that beta list. If not, just yeah, get into yeah. it in February when it comes out. Um, it's very in line with like my focus right now. I'm fucking rocking all the you know the neurofeedback and the TMS and the like wearables yeah, and stuff. So yeah, lay it on me. <laughs> <laughs> amazing uh, i can't wait yeah. can't wait to get the feedback from you from you and, and your audience beautiful is there anything you want to Thank share you. or leave us with before we say goodbye just god bless keep keep love keep loving love out loud yeah beautiful all yeah. right bye everyone and that's it darling hearts Thank you for stopping by the Labia Lounge. Your bum groove in the couch will be right where you left it, just waiting for you to sink back in for some more double L action next time. And in the meantime, if you'd be a dear and subscribe, share this episode, or leave a review on iTunes, then you can pat yourself on the snatch because that, my dear, is a downright act of sex-positive feminist activism. And you'd be supporting my vision to educate, empower, demystify, and destigmatize with this here podcast. Also, I'm always open to feedback, topic ideas that you'd love to hear covered, or guest suggestions. So feel free to get in touch via my website at freyograph.com or say hey over on Insta. My handle is Freya underscore graph underscore YMT and I seriously hope you're following me on that because <laughs> damn, we have fun. We have fun. Anyway, later labial legends. I'll see you next time. Hey, me again. If you'd like to support the potty and you've already given it five stars on whatever platform you're listening on, I want to mention that you can buy some really dope merch from the website and get yourself a labia lounge tote, tea, togs. Yep, you heard that right. I even have labia lounge bathers or a cute fanny pack if that'd blow your hair back. So uh, if fashion isn't your passion, though, you can donate to my buy me a coffee donation page, which is actually called buy me a soy chai latte because... I'll be the first to admit, I'm a bit of a Melbourne cafe tosser like that. And yes, that is my coffee order. <laughs> you can do a once-off donation or an ongoing membership and sponsor me for as little as three fat ones a month. And I also have a Sunroom profile over on the Sunroom app, as I've mentioned. And I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching and online courses that'll help you level up your sex life and relationship with yourself and others in a really big way. So every bit helps because it ain't cheap to put out a sweet podcast uh, into the world every week out of my own pocket. So I will be undyingly grateful if you support me and my biz financially in any of these ways. And if you like, I'll even give you a mental BJ with my mind from the lounge itself. Saucy. Um, I'll pop the links in the show notes. Thank you. Later.